Hi, welcome to Radiology for Patients. I'm Dr. Ron Workman. In this video, I want to discuss peripherally inserted central catheters, or PICs. But before we can do that, we need to lay down a basic understanding of the circulatory system. The components of the circulatory system would include the heart, which is the pumping mechanism, the blood, which carries nutrients and oxygen throughout the body, and the arteries and veins, which are the conduits for the blood. The arteries really are not part of this discussion. However, the veins, as you will see, are quite important for this discussion. In the context of this discussion, as a rule, think of the veins as returning deoxygenated blood to the heart. The systemic veins of the body can be divided into peripheral veins and central veins, and can also be divided into superficial veins and deep veins. Peripheral veins are those within the periphery of the body, for instance, the arms and the legs, whereas the central veins are larger veins within the neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, and the inguinal region, also known as the groin area. The peripheral veins converge and become larger as they reach the heart, and that's why the central veins within the neck and chest, abdomen and pelvis, and inguinal regions are the largest of the veins. These veins further converge into the largest veins in the body, the superior vena cava, which lies just above the heart, and the inferior vena cava, which lies just below the heart. Superficial veins are veins within the superficial tissues of the body. Take, for instance, the veins that you can see coursing just underneath the skin on your hand, for instance, or anywhere else in your body. Deep veins, however, tend to be larger and are not visible through the skin. Now that we've established a basic understanding of the circulatory system, let's discuss intravenous or IV access. Patients may need intravenous access for a variety of reasons. Patients may be unable to eat or drink and become dehydrated, necessitating the infusion of intravenous fluids. Patients may need intravenous medication or nutritional support, or they may need blood or blood products. Most IVs that are placed are placed at the bedside within a peripheral, superficial vein, usually in the hand, wrist, forearm, or antecubital fossa. These are very short, traveling only about an inch or so within the blood vessel. These intravenous catheters are meant to last only a very short period of time, usually just a few days, and are sufficient for the majority of circumstances where IV access is necessary. There are, however, circumstances where peripheral temporary IV will not be sufficient. Sometimes medications need to be given which are irritating to the blood vessel and need to be administered into a larger caliber blood vessel that has a substantial amount of blood flow. Patients who require long-term nutritional support will also need a more robust type of intravenous access. In these cases, it's necessary to place a central venous catheter. Central venous catheters, or central lines as they are often called, are IVs that are placed into the large central veins, either in the neck or upper chest area or the inguinal area. The veins within the neck are the jugular veins, and in the upper chest, deep to the collarbone, you have the subclavian veins, and in the inguinal or groin area, you have the femoral veins. Like a peripheral IV, these can be placed at the bedside as well. However, because there is a slightly greater risk profile to these catheters, these are placed by physicians. The risk of central venous catheterization is on the order of 10 to 20 percent, and the risks would include bleeding, injury to blood vessels, inadvertent arterial injury, and in the case of a subclavian vein attempt, potential for pneumothorax, which is injury to the lung where the lung deflates. Remember that arteries and veins typically travel together, and so large veins in the neck, the jugular veins, will have nearby the carotid arteries. The subclavian veins have the subclavian arteries nearby, and likewise the femoral veins are close to the femoral arteries. In very rare cases, during central venous catheterization, there can also be the induction of an abnormal heart rhythm. This is due to the way in which the catheter is manipulated into the large veins of the chest. And if the catheter tip inadvertently touches the wall of the heart, 
it can cause what's called an ectopic or irregular heartbeat. A safer alternative to direct central venous catheterization is the PIC, or the peripherally inserted central catheter. Now that you understand peripheral and central, you can see how a peripherally inserted central catheter spares the patient many of the associated risks with direct central venous catheter insertion. Instead of puncturing a large vein in the neck, chest, or inguinal regions, a pick is placed within a peripheral vein, usually in the upper arm, although veins elsewhere can be used. The catheter is then threaded into this vein under x-ray guidance and is positioned so that the tip of the catheter is within one of the large central veins of the chest. It's the best of both worlds. You minimize the risk of vessel injury by puncturing a small vein in the periphery of the body but you benefit by having the catheter within a central vein so that all sorts of medications can be administered safely. Placement of a PICC line calls only for local anesthesia, that is, injection of anesthetic into the skin and soft tissues at the site of entry into the body. However, some patients may be especially anxious or nervous about this, and that's understandable. In those cases, I find it helpful to give an oral anti-anxiety medication such as Valium. If patients cannot take anything by mouth, agents can be given intravenously or intramuscularly in some cases. In very young patients, heavier sedation with more closely monitored anesthesia will be necessary as it's important for those patients to remain as still as possible during the catheter placement. PIC insertion usually takes only a few minutes from start to finish. However, if you include patient transportation and preparation time, especially if heavier, deeper, monitored anesthesia is necessary, it may take up to an hour. Another point to consider is that we like to place these within a sterile environment, much like you might see in an operating room, for instance. The reason is, is because we are taking a foreign object, this catheter, and placing it into the body and we want the catheter to last as long as possible, and in many cases these catheters can last up to six or eight weeks. Because of that, we want to minimize the risk of infection, and that's why we treat it as a sterile operating room type procedure. Unfortunately, no medical procedure is without risk. Although very safe, the risks of PICC line placement would include blood vessel injury, arteries and veins, bleeding, infection, and blood clot formation. The risk of any complication with PIC insertion is very low. An extremely rare complication would be the development of an irregular heart rhythm during catheter placement. For women who think they might be pregnant, they need to make sure and let their physician know prior to PIC placement. Also, women who may have had a mastectomy or an axillary lymph node dissection or radiation therapy to the chest or breast for breast cancer should also let the radiologist know prior to the procedure. The veins in the arm that are most frequently used are those in the upper arm, specifically the basilic vein, cephalic vein, or brachial vein. At this point in the discussion, I'd like to show you the contents of a peripherally inserted central catheter kit so you can see an example of what the components are that you'll experience on the day of your procedure. As with any procedure that involves placing a foreign object into the body, PIC lines come sterilely packaged. Since this is purely for demonstration purposes, I'm not wearing sterile gloves, and this catheter is not going to be used in a real case. Also keep in mind that your catheter may look very different from this, and that this is but one example of a catheter currently available. The first step in placing a catheter is to puncture the vein, and this is the hollow needle that we use to do that. Once we've punctured the vein, we then introduce through that needle this very soft, floppy-tipped wire in order to gain further access into the vein. Here you can see that the wire is engineered to be placed through the needle. 
Once the wire is safely into the vein, the needle is removed, leaving the wire in place. The next step is to use this two-part device called a transitional dilator. The inner component is a removable dilator, and the outer component is what's called a peel-away sheath. The two components are used as a single unit initially and are placed over the wire and then gently over the wire placed into the vein. The inner dilator and the wire are then removed, leaving the sheath in place. This is designed to break apart and peel away, and I'll demonstrate that shortly. This is the actual catheter. And as you can see, this particular version has three individual ports, each with its own clamp. A variety of medications and blood products can be administered, and blood draws can also be performed. The catheter itself is graduated with centimeter hash marks. And you can also see that the catheter is very soft and pliable. Once the catheter has been sized to the individual patient, it is cut to the appropriate length. Once cut, the catheter is then placed into the peel-away sheath, and as you can see, the catheter emerges from the tip of the sheath, which, remember, is still inside the vein. The sheath is then broken and peeled off of the catheter, leaving just the catheter in place. For comparison, here is a temporary IV, such as might be placed at the bedside. As you can see, it's much shorter than the pick, and this particular one is just one inch in length. It too is somewhat pliable for comfort. Now let's watch a real case. The patient's left upper arm is sterilely prepped and draped. A sterile cover has been placed over the ultrasound probe, and it is brought into the field, and some sterile gel is applied to the skin. The radiologist then uses the ultrasound device to visualize the vein within the tissues of the upper arm. Here you can see it as the black dot in the center of the screen. The skin overlying the vein is anesthetized using 1% lidocaine injection, and a small needle is then placed into the vein under real-time sonographic guidance. At the beginning of the case, before the patient's arm was prepped and draped, a small elastic tourniquet was placed at the upper arm to help visualize the veins. The basilic vein is used in this case. A small wire is then threaded into the hub of the needle and advanced into the central veins of the chest. This is a glimpse of the catheter, which will then be sized and cut to the appropriate length. A small nick is made in the skin, and some pressure is held. The entry needle is removed and the peel-away sheath is then placed over the wire and carefully threaded over the wire and thus into the vein. The lights are dimmed and the patient is positioned under the x-ray device. And here you can see, under real-time x-ray guidance, the wire being advanced centrally into the central veins of the chest. The catheter has been cut to appropriate length, and the wire is cleansed and placed back into the catheter to provide some support during final catheter positioning. The wire will, of course, be removed before the end of the procedure. The inner portion of the peel-away sheath is removed and the catheter is placed into the sheath. Here you can see the catheter being positioned into the chest under x-ray guidance. The skin is then further anesthetized the wire is removed and the catheter is flushed and sewn in place. Fortunately, most pick lines are very well tolerated and can last for several weeks without incident, long enough to manage most conditions which necessitate their placement. When it comes time for the catheter to be removed, the sutures which hold it in place, or if placed without suture, the dressing which holds it in place, are simply removed and the catheter is pulled out. This can be accomplished by your home health nurse or the nurse that sees you in the hospital, and of course your physician can remove the catheter as well. Once the catheter has been removed, a fresh dressing is applied, 
and some pressure is held over the side to minimize any oozing or bleeding. Pick lines have truly revolutionized modern medical care with regards to intravenous access. You have the benefit of a central venous catheter with the benefit of peripheral insertion. These catheters are very safe. Although they do have some risks, those risks are extremely small. In some cases, patients will need even longer term intravenous access, such as that obtained for hemodialysis. These catheters are tunneled catheters. Or patients, who, especially those who need long-term chemotherapy, may have an arm port or a chest port placed. We will discuss these cases in subsequent videos. Thanks for your attention. We'll see you next time.